Hello, everyone. It's so good to be here today. It's um, evening in Poland. It's 7 p.m. here in Poland, but I can see on the chat that you are from all over the world. Spain, Israel, Scotland, UK, United States, Oregon, Netherlands, um, Ireland, Israel, Canada. Wow. So amazing to be able to meet in this, you know, these difficult times, but at the same time to be able to meet so many people from all over the world. Um, today, we will be talking about uh, the six tools for better IFS integration. And um, we are here on Zoom. Um, it's a little bit different Zoom because it's a webinar Zoom. So um, it may be a little bit different uh, what, what you see here. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, just turn it off and turn it on again. You can use the link again and then you will probably be able to, to join effortlessly. Um, it is being recorded. So uh, we will send it out to you via email two days after this live event. Um, so if uh, you would like to watch it again, there would be no problems with that. Um, we did a poll about your experience with IFS and uh, Philip, can you show us the the poll? Can, how can we see what are the the numbers. Oh, you probably see now that 53% less than a year, 26% one to three years, 7% three to five years, and 13% more, more than five years. So nice to have this um, image of that. I can see that someone is asking about the length of the webinar. It will last about one hour, maybe one hour and 10 or 15 minutes, but not longer than that. So very shortly introducing myself. I'm Michael, I'm from Poland. Um, my history of IFS, I stumbled upon IFS after working as a coach for more than eight years. And you know, it clicked constantly like with most uh, probably of you. I did my level one in Bristol, then level two and three in Sheffield. So I was training with the UK team, which was amazing. Um, I was able to being a PA, uh, be a PA two times. And now as an IFS I partner, we are bringing IFS to Poland, which is very exciting because just in one week, we are kicking off our first translated level one. So it will be translated into Polish and it's a really big day for us. Um, I created Life Architect more than 10 years ago uh, as a way to change the face of therapy and education uh, in the world. And we, for now, we are a small team of 12 people in the uh, city of Poznań in Poland. Um, but we have uh, quite a big plans around sharing IFS with the world. And in this year, in 2021, we will do it mostly by sharing the voice of uh, great teachers. And today, one of uh, them is with us. It's uh, Michelle Glass. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Michael. Nice to be here with everybody from all over the world. It's been fun to see where everyone's from. But thank you, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would like to say just a few words, Michelle, about yourself um, to introduce uh, you to, to our group. Um, Michelle is a level three certified IFS practitioner and alternative counselor and soul collage facilitator in Eugene, Oregon. Um, Michelle is an author of the well-received book, Daily Parts Meditation Practice, um, a journey to embodied integration for clients and therapists. And she provides daily parts meditation practice workshops at the annual IFS conference and around the world, as well as offers support for those wanting to work with the tools of the DPMP process. Additionally, Michelle is the editor of the Foundation of, for Self-Leadership magazine Outlook. So um, probably some of you received that in your email inbox. Um, it's a really great 
uh, read. Yeah, so we will today, I will start with asking Michelle about her journey with IFS and with her tools and um, with the book. And then we will talk about the, um, the idea of integrating IFS therapy. Like why do IFS needs integration and what is integration anyway? And um, what are the six tools that Michelle developed to help the process of integrating IFS therapy? Um, and closer to the ending, we will share um, about one of our uh, workshops that we are planning with Michelle quite soon. So this is the plan. And Michelle, like the, my first question is about your, you know, how did you stumble upon IFS? How did it happen? What inspired you to mm. focus on this? Yeah, it's always fun to hear how people come to IFS. Um, for me, I had been in therapy for three years um, for my PTSD and complex trauma from my childhood. <clears throat> and my therapist um, was using Hakomi, which was helping um, to some degrees, but it wasn't until one day she began using IFS with me and that session felt so radically different um, on many levels. And at the end of the session, I just said, I need to know what you did differently today because this is my, my body, everything's just responding so differently to this and this is what I need. And it, it was at that point she said she had just come back from her uh, level one training and learned IFS. And so I went home immediately and Googled IFS and learned about it and then jumped right into one of Dick's um, workshops down at Esalen. So I pretty much within, I think it was maybe a month or two after that first initial IFS session that I, um, you know, met Dick at Esalen and from that um, workshop came home to request um, to work with my therapist um, twice a week and extended sessions and just just an IFS focus the whole way through. So that's kind of how I came to that. It's a very interesting story and uh, nice how, how sometimes it's not us that, uh, you know, stumble upon uh, a method like that, but it, it somehow comes to us. Um, from the podcast you recently did with uh, IFS Talks, I learned that um, some time after you stumbled upon IFS and started your therapy with that uh, modality, you um, started to develop your own tools, like your own ways to, to support the process. And I'm curious um, what needs in particular you were trying to, your parts were trying to take care of um, with this, you know, creative flow of developing these tools? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, let's see. I'll start with just saying one of, the, one of my top managers wouldn't relax back um, or give space in my sessions unless I recorded all my sessions and I did a lot of journaling between. Um, and so I had a whole bunch of I guess you might want to say raw data or just all the details from both my sessions and then in between sessions, how I was feeling or how parts were responding. Um, and then when I began to have unburdenings, um, a part of me decided, oh, this is really important to keep hold of these, these details of where these parts were retrieved um, from and to what they unburdened um, and then where they, uh, their return quality. So that was something that felt really essential to hold on to. And that's when I began creating parts catalog cards. But um, along my therapy journey, and I think even before IFS, my therapist um, had mentioned Dan Siegel and talked about how, um, you know, how some people need to have a coherent narrative or, or that's kind of a desire. And as soon as I heard just, I didn't even know what coherent narrative meant at that moment. But when I heard it, something was like, oh gosh, I need that. And so I went and read a little bit about Dan Siegel. So for me, I think looking backwards, um, one of the biggest needs for my system was that coherent narrative. And 
that's where some of these tools eventually um, led to helping with that. Um, and just, just for a deeper sense of wholeness, I, I felt better along the way with each of the unburdenings and getting in touch with parts and unblending, but there was still something, something I couldn't put my finger on and it was more of um, an integrative process of wanting to have some more wholeness that um, kind of kept parts of me um, active with these things that I later learned were tools. I didn't know that along the way, but it was later that I found them. So can you, can you maybe share a little bit what is the coherent narrative? I heard it somewhere, but I'm very curious about that. Uh, what it, to me, what essentially is it, <laughs> the base of that is just trying to make sense or meaning out of the madness of our experiences. Like, what does that really mean? Um, and I think outside of the IFS lens, it could um, look different. But for me, within the IFS lens, having that coherent narrative is really knowing who all these parts are and what they experienced and what their roles were, why they needed to do these things, um, and to have a really more conscious um, conscious uh, relationship and attention to all these pieces. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And w what I particularly love about IFS is that it's, um, it seems to me that the model and the creator of the model, Richard Schwartz, is so open to different modalities and to supplementing the IFS process with, you know, different ideas and tools and, and, and therapy processes. And I remember uh, when I was assisting in level one in Copenhagen, uh, it was Schwartz's last level one, which, which he did, which he, uh, which he led actually. And uh, I remember he was saying about like IFS is still in the making. It's not like a ready finished modality. It's something that is still being uh, developed and that adding new techniques and supplementing with other modalities is a part of this developmental process. Um, also, some, something that stumbles to my head right now is the latest book uh, by Susan McConnell about the uh, IFS and the body. And it seems like, you know, we still don't know where it will go. And um, I remember uh, someone on that training mentioned it about the morning check-ins with parts, like, you know, sitting and just saying hello, saying hi, saying hello to your parts. And for me, it was great because when I did my IFS, IFS therapy, I began with just, you know, doing sessions from a week, uh, from, from, from week to, to, to the next week, to the next week, and just meeting with a the therapist, but not doing nothing in between the sessions. So for me, it was um, very important to start adding to, to this in between the sessions. Um, yeah, Michelle, I'm, I'm curious about the book also, because um, you, you wrote a book about daily parts meditation practice. And um, I'm curious, why did you decide to, to write a book? Um, I remember that you were saying something about that it, it, it wasn't like, you know, very much planned before. So curious what happened. Mm. Yeah, I had not set out to write this book. Um, I have for the past maybe 15 years been trying to write my healing memoir about IFS and that's still in the making, but this book I had no intention to write. Um, <clears throat> I had gone to Esalen one year um, and in preparation for going there, my therapist said, you know, I think it's really important that you show Dick your pendants. And if anyone has the book, um, they'll see these pendants of mine of all my parts and my parts map and what I call parts biography. So I had these different, what I didn't know then were tools, um, these pieces of my integration. She suggested I show them to Dick. And when I was at Essel and I, I brought them to him to show them. And he immediately said, come sit down and, and explain this to me. And um, I want to know more. And after hearing and seeing the said, you know, I think this is really important. I would like you to come to the conference to present on this. And I hadn't presented anywhere for probably 20 years or more, probably. Um, 
and I wasn't quite sure how to do that. So I began writing a PowerPoint and outlining, you know, what I want to give to people. And it was very clear within the first week or two of working on that PowerPoint that this was a whole lot of material <laughs> if I wanted to convey it in the proper way. So I had this moment of, wow, this, this is actually a book and the conference is in like seven or eight months. Can I actually get this done in time? And so that's kind of the, the reason I wrote the book is because I knew I was going to be presenting at the conference and um, I wanted to be able to give people more than just um, even a skeleton. I wanted to give them a full-bodied um, approach to how these tools can work. So, uh, and that process probably took, I'm going to guess it was five to six months um, after working with a you know, full, full load of clients. So I was working pretty much 18 hours a day <laughs> for wow. those six months. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm very curious about the moment in which you, in which Dick said, you know, about uh, his excitement about the the thing that you you shared. Um, it must have been exciting, right? Like, what what parts of you were activated then? Uh, certainly, I had some dissociative part that came in right away. Like, oh my god, this is too big. Like, ooh. and I actually had to come back to him twice that in that week, and I said. Can you again tell me why you think this is good? <laughs> what what do you like about this? So yeah, I had a part that really um, felt overwhelmed that wow, there was something that Dick was finding meaningful in this. Um, and then after that settled down um, and listening to my parts, it just felt like a lot of recognition for my parts, hard work, and just being um, honored not only by myself, but by, to me, it felt very honoring to have Dick say, this is really meaningful, important, and to please come mm. present. And then he wrote a foreword for the book. And so, great. yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the idea of integration. Um, one thing that I'm particularly interested about uh, is the psychedelic uh, therapy and um, I've been you know like um, reading about it and, and um, attending conferences that for more than two years and what I learned is that the integration integration of the psychedelic therapy is of the psychedelic experience is like one of the most important aspects of it if the not the most important and I, I I didn't get the feeling the feeling and the mm, or maybe maybe not necessarily I I mean Dick often talks about meeting with the exile that was unburdened so it is a part of the integration but um, I'm very curious like what does integration mean in the context of the IFS process and is it so important as for example in the psychedelic therapy or maybe not 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 so much and why even ifs needs integration mm -hmm. wow there's a lot there <laughs> um yeah i think what do i want to begin with that um i think integrating is i think a natural part of um what we as humans need um, and I think maybe that it might even come just from our cultural burden around a unitary mind right and then we think that we're all just this one solid mind where in the IFS framework we know that we've got multiple parts and so if if we're completely blended with a part or a few parts and we don't yet know that um, that unblending process is very helpful, but then to begin to make connections and to begin to bring in conscious awareness of these parts are, is really helpful. And I guess I go back to, you know, some of the basic definitions of just what integration is to begin with, you know, to unite um, something with um, something else or to end the segregation and bring into um, alliance with every, um, with a larger society or organization. So, when we're looking with parts, um, to me, it's just, it's 
being very mindful about who all these parts of us are and having that conscious relationship with them. I know um, Gabor Mate is one of my mentors also, and and he's um, works within the psychedelic realm as well. And he talks a lot about integration. And for him, it's having it uh, daily, having some sort of tact. Um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, cord or memory or something from your journey that you've learned. And so in IFS, you know, Dick talks a lot about after we unburden parts um, to have a daily check-in with our parts for at least three or four weeks or whatever the part's needing. And that's a piece of that integration is just having that conscious relationship. And I think, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I know that they're finding that a lot of that neural um, development is happening, that refiring of those new, new neural networks with that repetition. So... Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for explaining that. Um, one of the ways that I was trying to, to support my IFS therapy, both as a, as a client and as a practitioner, was parts mapping. And um, it, it came to me quite uh, early and in, in my um, journey with IFS. And uh, as a client, I was often lost in my parts and it, it helped, helped me to see like the, the, the connections with the parts and also as a practitioner i i also was often lost because um you know doing one two three sessions and meeting like sometimes 12 or 15 parts throughout the couple of sessions um i found it really difficult to 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 have this 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 system that we found that we that we seen there we've seen there clear in my in my mind so um, I tried, you know, different approaches, like just um, naming the parts in, in some circles and connecting them, uh, then, you know, like writing uh, more details about it. And um, I, 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 was, I, I was looking for something like, like, like daily parts meditation, like uh, for, a, uh, for something that would show me how to really do it. I didn't find it then at that time. So um, I'm curious, what is, what is your approaching to parts mapping? And, and um, in a few moments, I will also ask you about, uh, you know, like introducing the six tools. So um, maybe if you could just tell us a little bit more general about parts mapping, why is it important to have the parts mapped? And uh, how do you think it helps us from the standpoint of the therapist and practitioner or the client? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, you know, when you earlier asked what, um, what needs were being met by these tools, um, al along my process, I, it was really clear I wanted to have a bigger picture of, of these parts. Like you said, it kind of, you felt a little lost with all these different parts you were meeting in a few sessions. And this, um, when I began to, to map my system, it was a few years after I had taken a break from a big, big long set of um, years with therapy. And um, I really wanted to have a visual. What, what does this look like? And it was a very long convoluted process to get to what you now see in the book or um, how I've mapped, but um, for me, it was important to see not only who the players were, so to speak, but who they were in relationship with. And, and that process took quite a while. Um, and we'll probably maybe get into that later. But um, I think it's for some people, who, especially people who are visual, it can be very great just to have it, like you said, once you had them kind of on paper, um, at least I got the sense from what you're saying, it, it was a little bit clear for you or you maybe were able to be less blended yeah. you know that's a good way to also use for um some unblending but um yeah it was i think a mixture of both you know helping my own i guess my own self but other parts kind of make sense of those years of therapy how did how did it all look in some kind of 
mapped mapped system. So I think I'll pause there. I think there was another question you asked in the bear, and I'm forgetting that. Um, I'm not sure, but another another question popped up into my mind is: Do you have um, like a you know um, like a big map of your parts with all of the parts on one piece of paper? Well, mm -hmm, do you, I do. Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, <laughs> and that that's yeah. that's exactly what. Um, in in that time period what some of my parts were needing is just a real complete sense of what what is all in here how does it look um and a little side caveat um or note is when i was writing the book it was like maybe three weeks before being published and in the middle of the night parts just woke me up and said what we have here on this map that's the way it looked back in therapy that's not what it looks like now <laughs> And so I had actually had to make another map of what it looked mm -hmm. like after all of this integration had happened. So those two maps look differently. Amazing. And um, I'm also curious, do you usually do that, the parts mapping on paper, or did you try some also some electronic tools? Uh, initially it was all on paper and actually big, huge butcher paper and all different ways of trying mm -hmm. to get, get it onto one piece of paper. Um, but for the sake of the book, um, I did use, um, a really antiquated system, which I need to find something better for right now. Um, mm -hmm. my book is being translated into Spanish and I need to recreate those, um, maps that are in there, but I did use a, a digital form. Um, and, you know, it'd be nice to have a, an app where you could, you know, make maps of your system. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, another um, tool that I learned um, to help integrate the IFS process was uh, something about journaling. And what I like uh, particularly about this approach is that you can you can write from the different perspectives. Like you can write as a part expressing, just being blended, right, as a part expressing your thoughts and feelings. Um, you can right from a part to another part, like communicating with a different part or as a part to self or as self to part or as uh, a self to a part or as self for a part. So not, uh, yeah. So th these are like many different ways of, um, of using uh, the writing process. Um, so I, I, I am curious because it seems that there are you know many many different ways but um what's what is nice about the dpmp is that you have the like the uh clear set of six tools could you you know shortly describe those tools and and maybe with some short examples about how one can use uh, these tools in the process mm -hmm. yeah so well, since you spoke about journaling i'll start there um and and we can even bring in integration with that is you know when you're talking about journaling in those ways um the, a whole lot of different pieces of integration can come through no matter how you're who's speaking in the writing or who you're speaking to right so um one of one of the tools i have is <clears throat> excuse me um parts biographies which could look anything like just a short little paragraph about a part. It could be um, when I, when I teach this in my workshops, I have a distinguishing piece around whether it's a um, biography about a part, right? Is it self writing that biography or is it an autobiography? Is it written by the part? Um, and, you know, for me, I like to, especially once a part's unburdened, kind of have that history of what it was like in their burden state, what the transformation process looked like, and then um, how that part feels now unburdened and what they bring to our life. So that's kind of the biography. Um, and I, those biographies for me stemmed out of the other tool, um, parts catalog cards, uh, which is I alluded to earlier, kind of just capturing that um, unburdening process where parts were retrieved, uh, what and how they unburdened and their return qualities. <clears throat> um, but having that on, on you know, each of their own cards, 
it has some really key pieces about their transformation and on the back side I put their um, everything that we're witnessing about them their burdens their memories their experiences so on a parts catalog card you can have that just as a simple reflective piece to be mindful about each different part or you could take that and put it into a biography parts biography um, then there's uh, parts timelines which is exactly how I started making my maps as I took um, all my notes from my each session and wrote down the names of each part um, that came up in each session so a timeline is just like essentially a date with all the different parts that came up in that session and then you just continue down that sheet of paper with each new session and those can be helpful for a number of things not only just seeing who's a key player around a particular trailhead um, but also polarizations and alliances that you can begin to see and who's active more often or you can see as they heal um, they become less active and different parts come in um, and you can take those timelines to make parts maps as we just discussed a few minutes ago um, and then the two other tools are um, a daily parts meditation practice which um, happens to be one of my favorite things and, and that came from um, shortly after maybe it was a little bit before my time at Esalen with Dick um, where my top manager Ariadne had unburdened and was just really clear how important it was which I had done to varying different degrees that post unburdening maintenance check-ins with my parts but as my system got clearer and clearer I noticed within my system my parts were like we still want to have connection with self you know we still want something um, we don't want to just be forgotten and so I began a, a meditation practice just um, because of where I was at in my process it be it, the focus was on unburdened parts and then whatever new part I was getting to know at that time so it's it's really essentially a great way to keep in contact with all your parts um, and then the last tool is uh, the um, parts externalizations and uh, I was gonna you asked for an example and I'm just gonna swing my computer around yeah, just so people parts. can see on my wall there those are my um, parts pendants um, and if you have the book you'll see them inside the book and on the back but um, those are each of my parts and they each chose a pendant after they had unburdened to represent something that they felt important to or about them and so not only is it helpful for me um, in my own self to sit back and look at all my parts but depending on who's looking out of my eyes if it's a different part they can either be recognizing themselves independence or they can see all the other parts right um, so parts externalizations can come in all sorts of different ways um, and it doesn't have to be a, a physical thing it can be you know movement or music and such so those are a very short description of the tools yeah thank you for sharing your piece of the wall it was very nice to see um, your way of doing that um, yeah so so we we prepared a poll uh, then that you know um, if we are very curious about what particular tool you all are curious about the most and and um, the tool that will gain the most votes um, we will we, I will I will invite Michelle to to maybe speak speak a little bit more about um, so so Philip if, if, if that's okay you can turn on the poll and we will have like a 30 seconds for voting so just click on the poll that you probably see on your desktop right now on your screen and let us know which tool would you like to learn more about? And in 10 seconds, we will close the pool and we will see the votes.
Yeah, Hannah writes that it's hard to choose only one. Yes, I second that. Okay, Philip, maybe you can close the pool and let's see what are the numbers. Okay, uh, Michelle, do you see it as well? Ooh, I do, that's yeah. great. Uh, and I would love meditation. to have a copy of that. <laughs> okay, I will that's take great. a screenshot. Yeah. Thank so, you. Great. yeah, can you elaborate a little bit more about that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and first, I see in the chat somebody's asking for Shabo mm -hmm. the book. So I'm just going to yeah. put that up there. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, daily parts meditation practice. Um, and I recall that it looks like more than half of the people are have like less than a year of experience with IFS. So I want to kind of start with that in mind. Um, uh, with, with IFS, um, as we're witnessing parts and getting to know them, um, not a whole lot's required between sessions or after. But then once a part unburdens, um, it's really important to maintain connection with that part and check in with them daily. And so because of that piece, as I mentioned earlier, my parts really wanted to have something regular. And for me, what that looks like, um, you know, if, if you're familiar with different meditations within IFS, there's a lot of different ways to do it. For me, I like to begin with just noticing who's around, you know, as you're sitting and getting ready to meditate, just seeing what parts of you are active, who's thinking, who's wanting to do something or wanting to be elsewhere, and then inviting everybody to be around um, so that you can just witness as much as you can the whole group and then to ask for space just begin to ask for space so i like to get to this place of at the very beginning of it seeing what's needed for all the parts to give you space so you can be in yourself in yourself um, and taking a few minutes just and that few minutes can be one minute or it could be five or 15 whatever your system or you would like and you can add into your own um, DPMP meditation. At this point, you could add your other regular meditation practices that you like, but being in that place of self and extending that love and self energy out to all of your parts. And then what I do is I have, um, I've chosen a part each day. So um, and I'll, I won't go into how I do that or in different ways you might do that. That's for a bigger conversation, but I do choose a part each day to just reconnect with and see how they're feeling. What do they want me to know or what do they want um, to tell me um, about what's going on in my life? You know, some parts have a whole lot to say about a lot of things in your life and some parts could care less about certain pieces of your life. So it's in, in that way, that's another piece of the integration is just seeing who's, who's active in your life, where and why. Um, but then after having um, that time with a part, and because this meditation practice got um, developed after the bulk, or after many parts had unburdened, um, I like to end my meditation with really thanking the part for what they have done, right? I, I'm mindful of what their burdens used to be. I like to thank them for their courage to heal and remember pieces of their unburdening. I like to thank them for what they, um, their return qualities and how those um, energies or qualities impact my life and how I'm using them and think really being mindful of, you know, example, Ariadne who came up with this book. I'm just so grateful that she's done this um, for my own integration, but also I'm hearing from many people all over the world, how important it is for them. So I'm, thank the parts for what they bring to me and um, reminding them that I'm here anytime that they need. Um, and then after I close with that part, um, then I spend a few more minutes back in self and then I remind all parts that they can also have this time. And by now they know that because I've been doing this meditation for about seven years. Um, and so that's kind of a general outline of how I 
have formulated my daily practice. When I um, do my workshops, I talk a lot about getting to know what your system needs and to create your own unique daily parts practice um, with what your, what your system needs um, and taking my um, scaffolding or skeleton um, process and altering it to whatever fits for you or using it just as it is. I'll be coming out um, with a series of um, recorded um, DPMP meditations soon. So, but I'm going to pause and see if Please. Michael, if you have any questions about that piece of it, or if there's any follow through with with that. Um, no, actually not. But it's it's really great to hear that you're planning uh, recorded meditations. Um, I. You know, when, when, when we organize IFS trainings and there are usually the meditations are there, people are constantly asking about the recorded meditations, recorded IFS meditations. So I think it will be very, very useful. Um, I just wanted to name that uh, it's great that you are all asking questions in the Q&A section. And um, we will probably have a couple of minutes for, for uh, some questions. Um, and I will be referring to it a little bit later. So I uh, just wanted to say that it's great that you are sharing your questions here. Um, yeah, so, so Michelle, I, I would, I am very curious about the perspective of the client and um, uh, what is in your perspective, the most important thing uh, for us as clients in the therapy process to support the process. So for example, if our IFS therapist doesn't suggest anything, um, any tool or any activities to be engaged in, in between the sessions, what do you think we as clients can do to, um, to make that, to, to, to support the process in the best possible way? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, um, I think it's really important to really listen in to what, what your parts are needing um, and to really advocate for parts or if, if you're still um, blended a lot with parts, that's totally fine and a normal part of the process, but to really advocate for yourself about what you're needing um, and to really look at why different parts are needing that. Michael had asked earlier what needs were being met by these tools. And so you might listen in to see what your system or your parts are needing between sessions for me it was really important to to have some continuity or to to you know each of those unburdenings and those healings were really hugely impactful i knew i was feeling better but there was this why you know why am i feeling better and how does it all fit together so i would just encourage people to really listen in and see what what pieces are important for you um and then if you are wanting to do things between sessions, um, this book has, as you heard earlier, six different ways that you might want to integrate um, your sessions or to do different pieces between sessions. Um, some of these tools, three of the tools can be used by the therapist or practitioner if they're interested in doing that. So you, you could check with your therapist if they're interested in that too. Um, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I'll just say one other thing too is, um, <clears throat> you know, listening to what your parts need. I know money and time is all unique to everybody, but sometimes it can be helpful to do just more than one session a week. So if your system is wanting that, to really advocate for that too. It sounds like you also maybe did a little bit of that, but to... Um, yeah, if you're needing more than one session a week or if they're longer sessions to see if you can accommodate that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. And also, you, you know, um, some of my friends are engaging into, a, into peer groups and to like, you know, small practice groups in between the sessions. So I ac actually have one friend that's uh, apart from the IFS therapy is engaged in like three different peer groups. So it has like mm. many, many, many IFS sessions, uh, which is great if, 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 if we have time for, for that. Mm, but, but also probably for some of us, it's also good to mm, go and uh, in our pace, uh, which 
sometimes can be slow. Mm, yeah, so our we are slowly getting uh, to an end, and um, it, it it is a very short intro, and 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 we will also probably answer answer a couple of questions uh, soon. But um, I know that you have been organizing uh, workshops about the PMP, and um, and also we uh, have something to to offer. So can you share a little bit about that, about your workshops, how how um, it was, uh, you know, before the COVID and, and mm -hmm. how it is now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as much as I'm enjoying seeing all these people from around the world and, and I have a group of parts called the Traveling Wilburys who want to be mm -hmm. traveling to each of these countries and doing this. Um, so I'm glad in some way that COVID has, has made this more um, uh, feasible for people. Um, but before COVID, um, I was doing either one day or two day workshops um, or at, at the conference, they were half day workshops. Um, in person and you know if it was a one or two day it would be you know just getting some basics or like a toe dip into some of the tools um, in 2019 I did my first intensive retreat and in that people got a much deeper dive into the tools and a lot more experiential time so um, I do customize my workshops to what people who are, who are bringing me to do them. Um, so, um, but, it, you know, having an extended time is, is really helpful so that um, there's the space and the time, not only in, in the, the actual session or the meeting of the workshop, but then between. So um, we'll be talking a little bit about what's coming up in February, but Along the journey, um, those workshops have um, increased from half day to now five day retreats and such. And, you know, I had, ever since the book came out, I had requests to go all over the world and I, I'm one person and I had a client load too, so I couldn't go everywhere people wanted to. And I think a lot of people are um, showing up in these now online webinars. Um, partly because of that. And I guess that's one, one of the benefits of COVID um, is that we can have these larger groups like this now. Although I, my parts really miss the in-person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, we, we uh, decided with, with Michelle to, to give an opportunity to, to uh, organize, to, to, to offer uh, uh, two workshops actually. And these will be uh, two workshops that will uh, be um, taking place sim simultaneously. So uh, one will be for the therapists and practitioners, and the other one will be for the IFS therapy clients. Um, they, uh, the, the one for the therapists uh, kicks off on the 5th of uh, February, and the one for the clients kicks off on the, on the 6th of, uh, January, of uh, February. And these will be three-hour meetings once a week. Um, the therapist and practitioner one for four weeks and the clients one for three weeks. So um, 12 hours and uh, nine hours in, in total. Um, probably it's uh, also a nice idea to, you know, uh, if you are the therapist to have your a client, one of the clients go through it simultaneously or, or the other way around. If you're a client to to invite your therapist. Um, yeah, but this, this will be something that uh, will start in a round of uh, a month from now. And uh, we would like to invite you to join to take a deeper dive into the, uh, the PMP practice. Um, Michelle, would you like to tell a little bit more about, uh, about the offering, about the series mm -hmm. of workshops? Great. Yeah, I like to... Um remind people or maybe if this might be a first time thought for you but um, if you're a therapist or a practitioner I like to um, be mindful that you're also a client right as therapists especially in IFS we look at our own trailheads and we we have a relationship with our own parts so that they can give plenty of space for us to be in self with our clients so I'm just keeping that in mind and for the clients one of the beauties of the model is that over time, 
um, you begin to to facilitate your own sessions in between your um, therapy sessions. So you're be, kind of become your own practitioner in a way. So with that in mind, um, the, the therapist and practitioner uh, workshop series will be broken down into each of these different tools where um, you'll get some experiential time with your own parts um, and then using these tools in breakout practice groups with other therapists and practitioners to do mini sessions with these tools so that you can um, see how they fit for you and maybe alter them to your own um, way of working and then to begin to have some practice in using them with your own clients. Um, so we'll go through each of the tools in, in more depth with some experiential time. And then for the client one, it's pretty much the same. Um, the reason it's shorter is because we don't need breakout practice times with um, many sessions with one another. So you're, if you're a client or if you're a therapist doing the client one for your own integration and your own process, it'll be more of that one-on-one um, -on -one time of um, working with these tools for your own system. There will be breakout groups for sharing and um, connection with other people too for, from all around the world as well. So, um, but in each, no matter which uh, workshop it is, you'll have plenty of time to get to know the tools and the benefits um, and then some experiential time. And, and you'll get to, I believe these will be recorded. So if you wanna go back and re-listen to it, you can. Uh, we'll be certainly doing meditations um, with with every session, and I'm thinking there are, I think there are a few workshop days where we'll do multiple meditations in that as well. So, great, thank you, Michelle, for for explaining that and for uh, telling us about the workshops. Um, yes, these will be live and also recorded. So. Um, if you won't be able to attend the live sessions, you will be able to watch the recordings right right away, like 24 hours after the live session probably, and then to go in your own pace. And if you take a look on the chat, you will see the links, so you can click and see. Um, we will also send it to you via email after today's uh, webinar. Um, yeah, okay, so there are many, many questions 27, Michelle, I, I don't think we are able to, to, to answer, uh, you are able to answer all of those, those but I, um, I can see some of uh, the questions I, I, I would like to, to, to choose. Um, so is it okay to shift to questions? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the first one is, is from uh, Ciara. I'm not sure if I'm um, pronouncing the, uh, your name correctly. Um, and the question goes like that. What do you recommend to your clients to help strengthen? Um, sorry, no, 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 not this one. Yes. What do you recommend to your clients to help strengthen the connection between self and parts in between sessions? Mm, great. Um, well, if you, if you, in, if in that session, you've been getting to know one part, um, you, you can go back each day and then check in with that part. In the beginning, often it's not uncommon for different protectors to have concerns about that. So you might also want to be connecting with those protectors. Um, but, and I'm, I'm mindful again of that, you know, there's over half of the people have a little under a year's experience with the model. And so I'm trying to be mindful about um, language here with the un unblending. So as you're checking in with parts as best you can, being mindful of um, those eight C's. Um, if you're feeling any of those eight C's, if you're not, those are clues to which parts um, or that there are parts present. So to really just take some time inward and um, listen to who's, who's active. And you might do some journaling um, even in those check-ins, you can you know, create check-in um, parts timelines as well to see who's more active between sessions, so. Great, thank you. Um, 
The other question is from Alexandra and uh, Alexandra asks, do you think the journey with parts ever ends? Can you yeah. get to know a particular part completely or are they endless somehow? We should see yeah. them as an everyday informant to lead us within our life. Yeah, that's an interesting mm. one. That's a good one. Yeah, I think the journey never ends in many ways. Um, and I think it's unique for every person. I really do. Um, I see that with clients and I see that with colleagues and friends and myself. But, um, you know, at one point, Dick was asked, how many parts do people have? And he said, well, I'm guessing there's about 30 Um I'm waiting for my data to come through in a different way, but I think we have many more than 30 parts as an average um, based on my mapping. But I bring that up because, um, you know, if you are continuing a daily relationship with parts, you know who they are and you see how they evolve and they change over time and it, you won't be confusing them with another part. So I do see, um, sometimes where people keep thinking that's a new part and it's not because once you spend some time with it, you learn, Oh, it, this is the same part. So as far as, you know, does this ever end? I think it's a yes and a no. I mean, you can get to know the main players and you see how they evolve. Um, and it's fractal as Dick says, you know, each part has their own self and parts as well. And that can go, fractally um for me in my experience now having my daily practice i feel like um i feel like i have a very tangible concrete relationship with each of the 30 of my parts and um, some of them are parts of parts and i'm mindful that uh where there are triggers or um new trailheads and if those are the same parts or if they're new parts so mm -hmm. uh, it's a very long kind of question and, and yeah. philosophical thing but the journey i think never ends and especially if we're going to keep in relationship with our parts yeah it's it's always good to chew on questions like that um yeah and we have another question from jackie in the process of doing parts biography could it be possible that an exile part feeling too overwhelmed while doing the biography journaling how can it be monitored if that's the case if the if the exile is getting overwhelmed um yeah if the exile is overwhelming during the do, doing biography or journaling mm -hmm. yeah um well i think that I think even it sounds like this person might be mindful of that happening to them. I'm not, not sure if that's what she's meaning, but even being mindful that that's happening is a really good thing. And just to take some time and maybe pause in the writing and seeing what that part needs. Um, if it's, if it's feeling overwhelmed, I'm assuming it's probably blending in quite a bit. Um, maybe other protectors are starting to come in with that, but I, I would just suggest doing some pausing and just really um, connecting with that exile and letting them feel your self energy, um, reminding them that nothing's too much for self and that you're there with them. Um, as parts go through that witnessing um, and transformational healing of the unburdening process that becomes less and less or often is pretty much un unburdened so that overwhelm and all of everything they carry is gone at some point so that in that um way those biographies will change so if you're writing a biography of a burdened part that's going to feel a lot different than writing a part a parts biography of an unburdened part mm, yeah yeah okay mm, yeah so there's other questions other question from amy and it uh, sounds really interesting. Um, so Amy asks, I ha I've had several sessions and not yet mapped any parts or recorded them. Does it matter to start some way through the process? For example, start a timeline, even though many sessions and therefore parts are unrecorded, 
also does it matter whether whether parts are recorded in formal therapy sessions rather than outside of sessions mm -hmm. well a lot of good questions um you know i think you can record them in or out of session um either way um to me it was very helpful to have it recorded during session because i had um you know, I had everything there. I wasn't forgetting parts. Sometimes it's easy for parts to block remembering pieces of it. So in that way, I find it helpful to um, record sessions. But um, along your journey, no matter where you're at in your journey, it's a, um, if you're wanting to create a map or having timelines, it's great just to start where you're at. And then as you go, and especially if you're going to have a daily practice where you're checking in with parts, um, whether you're in the witnessing phase or they're with unburdened parts, you'll begin to be able to inquire with them if, um, if they're something that's been worked with before. Like if we're starting here and you didn't record or, or map parts from this segment, if you're in relationship with parts from here on, you can ask about past se sessions with each part. Um, and I think there was a, a piece in that, Michael, was it something about, is it important to do that or was that a piece um, of that? Yeah, also, does it matter when, whether parts are recorded in formal therapy sessions rather than outside of sessions? Yeah, yeah, I think I kind of spoke to that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, I would love to continue. Um, and we could probably sit here for a long time, but our time is limited. So, um, Michelle, can you speak a little bit about where people can find you if they would like to learn more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they can visit my website. It's um, thelistener.net. It's L-I-S-T-N-3-R.net. Um, and then you can find me on Facebook um, with the Daily Parts Meditation Practice. There's a group page for um, the general public. So it's a public one. And then there's a private Daily Parts Meditation Practice page. And that's for people who own the book um, and are going through the daily practice. So you'll be prompted through questions for that particular one if you have the book and such um and so you can um find me in those means and you, you know if people are using the process and have specific questions you can always email me my contact information is on um my website and i'll be happy to answer some questions along the way yeah yeah so so and you are writing another book right now right is that correct yeah. yeah, it's it's the one I've always intended to write. Yeah, okay. Um, and then it's taking a very long time. But um, yeah, I'm really hoping to um, capture what, you know, being in the, in the um, shoes of somebody with complex trauma, what it looks like in a very burdened system going through the unburdening process of IFS. And then on the other end of that, how it feels to have a self-led life and what it looks like and how radically different they feel. Great, great. Well, looking, looking forward to it. And um, also, um, you know, if in case some attendees would like to um, sign up for therapy with you, is that possible? Uh, at this time, no, I'm not taking new clients. Um, I'm a writing sabbatical for that book. Um, and I've also got a very long wait list for when I do return. So unfortunately not. Yeah. Okay, okay, of course. Um, yeah, so, so we, we are inviting all of you to our workshop series and it's still one month from now. Um, we will send you an email with the links and if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to, to have you here and to have this conversation and I, I, I myself learned a few important things for me. So um, thank you, it was very precious. Mm. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation to be here. And thanks for everyone who joined from all over the world. And I hope to meet you at some point. Yeah. Thank you. And um, have a great evening. And in your case, Michelle, it's morning, right? Yes. Have a great yes. day and evening to everyone, wherever you're at. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.